The Discovery, Chapter 5, A New Lease on Life The next morning, Luna returned from the dreamscape, a tired expression on her face, as she trudged to meet her sister for the sunrise and metaphorical passing of the torch from night unto day. As she entered their shared dining room, Luna's eyes fell onto her sister's brilliant form, along with two plates of pancakes waiting in her magical grasp. Luna arrived at the table and sat down, dreading the coming onslaught of questions. Well? Celestia asked expectantly. Well, what? Luna replied, trying to avoid the question. What did you see in David's dreams last night? Celestia asked with a bit more enthusiasm. Luna visibly cringed. She knew this was coming, but she wasn't sure how to deal with it. Lying to her sister would yield far worse results than telling her that she just didn't want to talk about it, but she had to know. Luna's cringing did not go unnoticed by her ever-watchful sister's gaze. That bad? Luna sighed. I saw a lot in his dreams. Memories of the crash, mostly. Memories of seeing his friends suffocate in the vacuum of space while he pounded on the glass to try and save them. The worst part, though, was the sheer pain and guilt that he bears. You know that when I enter a dream, I can sense how the dreamer feels, right? Yes, I remember you telling me. He bears an unimaginable guilt and immeasurable pain. He blames himself for the death of his friends, that much was clear. His mind repressed a lot of the actual events, but I could feel his raw emotions. If a creature like that can take down six of your guards while he was near death and endure that much emotional distress the whole time... Luna sighed again. With how advanced their technology is compared to ours, well, let's just say I don't want to know what his kind could unleash on us if more of them showed up and David does not put in a good word for us. The room fell silent. Luna took several moments to calm herself before looking at her sister again. Celestia's muzzle was crunched in thought. Seconds turned to minutes as the pair of royal equines stood, unmoved. Their thoughts drowned out each other's company. Then, finally, Celestia spoke. Well then, we give him good reason to be our friend. Three weeks later... And then, he said some of the most famous words of all time. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. David finished. So your species actually landed on the moon without any magic whatsoever? That's amazing! This Neil Armstrong sounds like an amazing person! Twilight replied. No magic whatsoever. Real magic doesn't exist back on Earth, remember? But yeah, he's an inspiration and my personal hero, actually. He was the first human being in history to leave Earth and land on a different planet. Or, well, moon, but still, the first man to leave Earth, land somewhere else, and make it back in one piece. David proudly said. David and Twilight had met every couple of days for the past three weeks. Throughout their meetings, they had shared just about everything that they could think of, from their respective species' achievements, to their own personal achievements, to their goals and dreams. As such, today was their third meeting this week, and David very much enjoyed his little time with Twilight. A chance to explain his history and his species' accomplishments with an extremely excited student was surprisingly rewarding. Of course, he had to leave some details out, or slightly twisted the story to sound better, but having to explain not one, but two world wars, and nuclear weapons almost destroying the planet several times over, would definitely paint humanity in a bad light. That's amazing, David! Luna's the only pony that's been to the moon here, but that wasn't exactly, uh, by choice. <laughs> of course, David didn't believe much of what Twilight said, and barely held back a snicker when she told him that she was the princess of friendship. He had outright refused to believe that Celestia raised the sun, or that Luna had been banished to the moon for a thousand years causing Twilight to nearly lose her mind in her frustration. Oh yeah, totally, David said as sarcastically as he could. Twilight's muzzle scrunched up immediately. She gets flustered so easily, David thought to himself with a smirk. Oh, we are not going there again, I don't know how to prove it to you. Just have Celestia and Luna stop moving them for a day. If the sun sets anyways, then there's proof right there. I would have asked them, but the thing is, I already have. Tia just laughs and says, maybe one day or something, to that extent. David said, not bothering to sit up from the bed that he was laying on. Uh, you know that they can't do that, especially for something as petty as proving a point to you. Twilight retorted. Well, I guess I'll just have to remain a heretic then. Twilight sighed. Uh, fine, just don't believe. One day we'll prove you wrong. I don't know, Twilight. In the last three weeks, I've seen plenty of firsts. I've seen unicorns, pegasi, actual magic, griffins, and everything here with a pulse can talk. But none of that is as ludicrous to me as a pony on this planet moving a star. The amount of energy she'd need to do that would rip the planet apart just because she was standing on it. 
Now, if you were to say that she rotates the planet because it's locked in some weird gravitational pull with the sun, then I'd have more traction with it. But not a star, though, that's just crazy. But the- Twilight was cut off by a knock at the door. A muffled voice came through. Princess Twilight, it's four o'clock. Your train will be leaving soon. We should get going if you're gonna make it. She checked the clock on the wall to confirm the news. It's already four? The last six hours went by so fast. Well, looks like time flies when you're having fun. David replied. Well, I'm sorry to leave just like this, even if you are still being stubborn. I will get you to come around eventually. Twilight teased. Yeah, we'll see, Twilight, we'll see. I'll see you next week, same time? Same time. I'll see you then, David. With that, Twilight hopped off of her chair and opened the door. David heard her hoofsteps along with a guard as they walked down the hall and out of sight. David sighed and slouched even lower into the mattress. Talking with Twilight was the highlight of his week, and every time after she left, he felt a little lonely. Even though the guards and castle staff had warmed up to him, David still felt like an outsider everywhere he went. He felt lost and alone. He had nothing back on Earth. Everyone he loved died decades ago. The only thing that he had were his friends on the ship, but they were all dead. And he had no way off of this planet even if there was something else out there for him. David had nothing but time to think for the past few weeks. He wasn't being held against his will, and while there were two guards posted outside of his room, they never stopped him when he went anywhere. They merely tagged along and stayed behind him. Even when he went to the kitchen to eat, they simply followed behind and sat near him as he ate. Even though they very poorly hid their distaste when he asked the griffin chef for meat, they dutifully followed him. David had been unable to get their names, and they rarely ever spoke to him. However, most ponies in the castle were very friendly towards him. David was roused from his musings by another knock at the door, though this time it was a soft, almost feminine knock. It's open! The door opened, and a pearl white mare with a brilliant flowing mane walked into the room. The door opened, and a pearl white mare with a brilliant flowing mane walked into the room. Lifting his head off of the bed, David saw Celestia enter and quietly close the door behind her. She turned and faced him. Mind if I join you for an hour or so? It's been a long day. Her voice, though tired and quiet, somehow maintained its soothing nature and warmth. Of course, David said, perking up instantly. David sat up and scooched to the side, as Celestia removed her regalia with her magic and laid on the bed, resting her head on David's thigh. He instinctively moved his left hand to scratch her barrel and his right to scratch behind her ear, earning a content sigh from the sun goddess. She closed her eyes as she relaxed under David's touch as he happily scratched away. David's relationship with Celestia had become something of a stigma around the castle the last few weeks. Celestia would disappear into David's room for hours at a time, and when she came out, her coat was a bit matted and she always wore a dopey smile. Many ponies in the castle assumed the worst. Of course, her true intentions were far less scandalous. That and he was a non-biased party for her to vent to. As David continued to scratch, eliciting small coos and nuzzles from the princess, he couldn't help but chuckle. What? Celestia asked, opening one eye. Um, nothing. It's just you're the Princess of the Sun, David said with air quotes. The leader of an entire nation and revered as a goddess to these ponies, but I'm betting I could get you to kick your leg like a dog if I scratch the right spot. Well, that depends. Do you know my spots? It's a little... lower. Her voice turned dangerously sensual as she trailed off. Oh, I... uh... well, well... David stammered, his cheeks now turning a shade of crimson. Hm, gotcha. Why do you ponies always have your heads in the gutter? Oh, whatever do you mean, David? I simply said it was a little lower. You were the one making assumptions as to what I meant. If any pony has their head in the gutter here, it's you. Celestia chastised with a smug look on her face. All right, fine. You got me there. Oh, I just remembered why I came here. Oh, so you mean it wasn't for scratches and petting? Celestia tilted her head, the light from the window catching her eyes. For a brief moment, David saw a genuine sparkle in those magenta eyes. How do her eyes manage to do that? David wondered to himself. Okay, the other reason I came here. I wanted to ask you if there was any job that you decided on. Oh, well, I've put some thought into it, but I just can't figure out what I'd really be good at other than security. I was infantry in the army and a security guard after that. None of my skills transfer over to anything else, really. Well, I have offered you a position in the Royal Guard. Twice. David frowned. I know, and I appreciate it, but I just don't feel right being a guard. I don't think I'd really fit in, you know? Besides, I'm not sure I want to work with the guys that tried to impale me and run me off of a cliff. 
Celestia regarded David's reaction with pursed lips. Ah, uh, I see. Well, while I understand your decision, I just want you to know that the offer stands indefinitely. Oh, uh, well, thanks to ya. David replied. A lot of people would do almost anything for an opportunity to pet Celestia or something. Though I suppose it's one of the best entertaining things that you could do while you're sitting on your ass all day bored. Anyways, let's get on to our productive donators. Top donators are 630, G10 Man, Only One Thing, Saru Ryan, and Iron Sky. Darkseid, Raiden, Narwhals, Black Moonheart, Pastel Skies, Austin Rollins, Stu Hex, Sword Brother and Mordred, Omicron Library, Will Chris Twinkie, Riot Soul, Badass Waffle, Shadow Moon, Luigi88, and many more amazing people. Thank you all so much for watching this video and live life to the fullest.